Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this series, we will review the key glomerular disorders that you will need to know for the Step 1 exam. As with all recordings, a PDF is available at the website. As mentioned in the blood pressure series, during Season 3, I will be repeatedly highlighting the importance of organizing diseases into categories. It will be impossible to retrieve and apply the huge volume of information you need to know on test day if you don't have a well-organized approach that fixes this junk in your mind's eye. I've included a CAT scan in my mind's eye. I wasn't expecting it to look so beautiful. So here is a categorical approach for the glomerulopathies now and forever, not just for step one. They're characterized as being either nephrotic or nephritic syndromes. The end. Really, if you can recognize glomerular disorders being either nephrotic or nephritic, you're more than halfway home. On the other hand, if you don't recognize the language and their NBME descriptors, you are dead in the water. In this slide, you can see Marlin didn't know what selective albuminuria was, so he got eaten alive. Poor fella, he should have listened to the rest of the video. So we'll cover the specific disorders in subsequent videos, but for now, I want you to start organizing the conditions. There are only three glomerulopathies causing nephrotic syndrome that you have to be familiar with on step one. These include minimal change, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and membranous nephropathy. Put a little arrow in quotes between minimal change and focal segmental glomerular sclerosis because I do love that description in Pathoma envisioning what would happen if minimal change in a kid went on to scar in the adult. What would it look like? FSGS. That description is a keeper. In terms of thinking categorically, it is useful to think about the cells or mechanisms involved in the injury. In the nephrotic syndromes, the bad player is the podocyte. We'll beat this to death when we review the specific disorders. Here are the key nephritic syndromes. As you can see, I broke them into two groups, as these disorders will be traveling in tandem throughout the cue banks and on the boards. That is, most questions on nephritic syndrome will boil down to you distinguishing IgA nephropathy from post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis or Wagner's from good pastures. As with nephrotic syndrome, it is useful to think of the disease manifestations by considering the source of injury, that being a broken or injured glomerular basement membrane. Once you break the basement membrane, kidney injury ensues with leaking of RBCs into the urinary space. So here are the seven disorders that you will need to fix in your mind's eye, really. They won't do you any good in notebooks or on flashcards. You have to live and breathe these things. We'll sort them out in subsequent sections, but I'm just putting you on notice. This is medicine, so there are going to be all kinds of exceptions in miscellaneous categories. Both membranoproliferative and lupus are described as overlap syndromes presenting as either nephrotic or nephritic syndromes. We'll deal with these later. Likewise, although amyloid and diabetes may present with nephrotic syndrome, renal manifestations of these disorders are presented in their full context. That is, these don't present as mysterious glomerulopathies on step one. Instead, you are given a diabetic with profound proteinuria. They go on to ask pathology derivatives about nodular glomerulosclerosis. So let's get into the important stuff. For the remainder of this video, we'll focus on the language of the syndromes and the subtle or tricky ways they will be distinguished. Our first branch point is that of heavy proteinuria nephrotic syndrome. Heavy meaning three and a half grounds of protein. If a question stem includes this information, do not choose a nephritic disorder. Three and a half grams is how the MBME says nephrotic syndrome. I wrote it in French too for those of you living in northern Maine. So we just emphasize heavy proteinuria in nephrotic syndrome, but the converse will be true in nephritic syndrome. That is, these patients may be reported with proteinuria, but mild is the operative phrase. It will be considerably less than three and a half grams. These patients might be described as one to two plus protein on urine dipstick, but don't be misled. Two plus protein in a patient with acute kidney injury does not make this nephrotic syndrome. In fact, this is a urine dipstick on a patient of mine with IgA nephropathy, mild proteinuria. So as proteinuria is the hallmark of nephrotic syndrome, red blood cells, and specifically RBC casts in the urine, are the hallmark of nephritic syndrome. But just as mild proteinuria is seen with nephritic syndrome, RBCs may be seen in nephrotic syndrome. So a patient with 3 grams of protein and some RBCs does not have nephritic syndrome. So these are the key descriptions that the NBME will use to draw your attention to a particular disease or disorder. However, these lead to some predictable derivatives you need to be familiar with. But before proceeding, they will use other code language for the overlap syndromes. Sneak preview. They focus on the pathologic findings and mechanism of injury. All right, so we know our patient has nephrotic range proteinuria. 
without even focusing on the disorders, what are the other derivatives that follow, and what is the code language they will use to describe those derivatives? Let's start with the pathology derivatives. Pictured in this slide is the normal filtration barrier. Note the glomerular basement membrane is described as a fusion product synthesized by both the vascular endothelium and the visceral epithelium, aka the podocyte. First, you'll note the size restriction or barrier of the endothelial fenestration that normally prevents cells from exiting the capillary lumen and entering the urinary space. Moving on, both the basement membrane and the filtration slits between the podocyte foot processes serve as size and charge barriers. The charge barrier is most important in restricting movement of anionically charged molecules and proteins such as albumin. This is a key point and favorite test derivative. And here are additional images noting the capillary endothelium, glomerular basement membrane, and filtration slits. With that background, we could dig a little deeper into the pathophysiology. In the nephrotic syndromes of interest, namely minimal change, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and membranous nephropathy, they all share in common the same pathologic process of foot process effacement, with the result being loss of those nice little filtration slits. Let's emphasize that the foot processes are components of the podocyte, and although injured or damaged, the basement membrane is basically still intact, representing a size barrier to cell efflux. Regardless of the process that damages the podocyte, an end result is the loss of the anionic charge barrier. So the damaged filtration barrier loses its charge, and the result is predictable. Namely, negatively charged albumin is able to translocate across the basement membrane, resulting in proteinuria. The proteinuria is described as selective when the majority of proteins lost consist of albumin, as seen in minimal change disease. By inference, the albuminuria reflects a loss of the charge barrier rather than frank damage to the glomerular basement membrane, which would permit other proteins to leak out as well. This is a small point, but if they ask it, you should be aware. Circling back, these are the glomerulopathies that present with nephrotic syndrome and may be characterized by any of the pathologic features just reviewed, including foot process effacement, loss of charge barrier, and selective proteinuria. So that was fun, but losing all that protein has consequences or derivatives for step one. So what are they? Here they come. Our first consideration is the presence of edema or swelling. The swelling can be found anywhere, but when they describe a young kid with puffy eyes, keep nephrotic syndrome on your short list. Do be aware that the edema is on an oncotic, not hydrostatic, basis. So here comes the consequence of non-selective urinary protein loss. When you lose natural anticoagulants, such as antithrombin-3, in that proteinuric urine, the patient is noted to be relatively hypercoagulable. One of their favorite hypercoagulable derivatives includes renal vein thrombosis, which is pictured. And they like this thrombus because it creates a patholinatomic test derivative, namely that of a new or acute onset varicocele. What is the cause or where is the lesion? Recall the left testicular vein drains into the left renal vein. So a clot sitting in the renal vein is a nice setup for the varicocele. In terms of hypercoagulability, we also note risk related to an increased serum concentration of fibrinogen. Where is that coming from? And here is the other key consequence of hypoalbuminemia. The liver is ramped up. It is trying to make up for the protein losses. So besides increasing production of the fibrinogen, lipoproteins are the main consequence of hepatic synthesis. And how will that be recognized? The patient with nephrotic syndrome will be noted with hyperlipidemia. The lower the plasma albumin level, as seen on the x-axis, the worse the lipids. So you can expect to see high lipids in a vignette describing nephrotic syndrome. And how does the albumin loss and elevated lipoproteins affect the urine? Here it is. The urine will be described as foamy or frothy. This is thought to occur as albumin decreases urinary surface tension. In addition to albuminuria, there is abundant language describing fats that get excreted in the urine. You should be familiar with all three descriptions, including the fatty cast, the oval fat body, which represents sloughed epithelial cells filled with lipoproteins, and or the Maltese cross, which is seen on polarized microscopy. Any of these findings may be described and are all manifestations of ramped up lipoprotein production by the liver. And that is it for the nephrotic syndromes. Any and all of the descriptors just covered can come up in nephrotic syndrome questions and or will be used as descriptors for the three syndromes to be discussed in the next video. Fortunately, the descriptors associated with the nephritic syndromes are much more straightforward. The nephritic syndromes can be characterized by a break in the basement membrane. That break permits cellular elements, and in particular, red blood cells, to enter the urinary space. Pictured here is the capillary lumen and urinary space. 
you can see an RBC in the act of escaping and a damaged one that already made it through. There are a number of ways that can describe those RBCs in the urine. Commonly, they will just describe the urine as dark, but you might see other descriptors such as cola or rust-colored urine. And as a result of those RBCs squeezing through the damaged basement membrane, cells might be described as crenated or dysmorphic as pictured here. That makes sense. But here is the most specific feature, RBC casts. Pictured is the nephron with RBCs traveling down the tubules. In the thick ascending loop, TAM horsefall mucoprotein is excreted into the lumen, and in the collecting tubules, casts are ultimately formed. The mention or image of a single RBC cast or dysmorphic red blood cell in the urine is pathognomonic of nephritic syndrome. Pathognomonic is big. The NBME can't mess up pathognomonic features. Actually, they can and do with insane derivatives, but that's a topic for another day. All right, let's bring this home. The nephritic syndromes are characterized by renal injury that ultimately results in loss of functioning renal mass. You just have less kidney available to do its job. Once you appreciate this concept, the rest follows. The patient may have mild proteinuria, which makes sense since the GBM is injured. The creatinine is elevated due to the widespread loss of renal function. Hypertension is noted due to activation of the RAA, and the patient may be described with edema on the basis of a decreased GFR. Insofar as clinical pathological correlation, the patient may be described with rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis or crescents. I can't tell you how many students readily identify this concept but don't understand the clinical translation. When they refer to RPGN or crescentic GN, they are telling you the patient has rapid and extensive renal injury. As a result, these patients will have a decreased GFR that is characterized by an elevated creatinine. But the flip side is true, and this is the one that makes me nuts. If the creatinine is normal, the patient does not have rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. Do you understand that? It doesn't matter how much hematuria they describe in a question vignette. If the creatinine is normal, RPGN has been excluded. Insofar as the crescents, they are the hallmark of RPGN. You should be familiar with their location in Bowman space and the constituents of those crescents, including parietal epithelial cells, inflammatory cells, and fibrin. And to summarize, the nephritic syndromes are characterized by loss of RBCs due to the defective basement membrane. The hematuria may be characterized by a dark urine or more classically by the presence of RBC casts. The renal damage is manifest by a decreased GFR resulting in edema, hypertension, and elevated creatinine. When severe and extensive, the condition is referred to as RPGN or crescentic glomerular nephritis. And as a reminder, here are the four players you are most likely to see on the boards. They will be addressed in part three of this series. In subsequent videos, we'll cover specific features of these disorders, but you needed to appreciate the clinical categories and varied descriptions of the nephrotic and nephritic syndromes if you have any hope of retrieving the key information on test day. If you have any questions or concerns on any of this material, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.